Hello and welcome to Liberty Hub, Defending the West. My name is Anna Maria Pocuraru and alongside my co-host Dr. Mihail Namtu, we will be up front with you, all in discussing the Chinese dragon, the enemy of the free world. This is quite a long and developed episode, thus we will dive right into the concrete. We will expose China's structural threats in areas such as politics, health and economics, with a tempered look into the link between Brexit's enemies and Hong Kong's invaders. The atomic world, China refuses to negotiate new nuclear weapons reduction, then the news flash that Britain has given up on Huawei, and finally we will address the Christians in Hong Kong, who are under the thumb of the Chinese Communist Party. Through these discussions, we will also touch base upon the Chinese imperialism in Europe and the strategic acquisitions made by them in Europe. As I said before, this is a packed one and you don't want to miss a thing. I would like to welcome Mike and thank him for always taking the chair opposite of me, only in space-wise. Thank you so much. China is the enemy of the free world. We have to discuss this uh, very important topic because our parents' generation was fighting against the Soviet Union. Perhaps our generation will have to fight against uh, this kleptocracy which was uh, put together by the Communist Party in Beijing. Let's start with the structural threats of China. What are they and how do we address them? Everybody has to understand that China is not a normal country. I mean, we talk about nations in general, and that's fair enough. I mean, we believe in, in the power of nations to bring about prosperity for the individuals living in that particular country. So the nations are valuable and important. But China is not just a nation, it's an empire. China has conquered uh, parts of Tibet, which were never part of China. China is now having a, a very aggressive stance towards India, as we have seen. Some uh, Indian uh, soldiers were killed at the border, close to the Himalayas. We know that China was always aggressive towards Taiwan and Hong Kong. Obviously, they hijacked the dream of freedom in Hong Kong. And uh, obviously, China is very aggressive towards the Philippines in uh, the South China Sea. We saw that expansion of the military base. Apart from this territorial aspect of imperialism, we've, we have to take into account a new kind of imperialism, which is the commercial imperialism of China. You will ask me, okay, Mike, but why are you saying China is in, an imperialist power when we have America here, when we have the military base of uh, you know, NATO in uh, Mikhail Kogelnichanu location? It's called MK by the Americans. Uh, well, there's a big difference. We invited the Americans to come. We, the Romanians and uh, the Poles and the Hungarians and the Eastern Europeans in general uh, were very much willing to have the Americans uh, giving us a military protection. But I have to say that the Tibetans never invited the Chinese to help them in any way. That's why you have Dalai Lama uh, basically being... Um, a global citizen right now because he doesn't get to be accepted by uh, the Chinese uh, party. So th there's a huge difference between China and America in terms of you know their position in the world. America is loved in many parts of the world because of the social and military and economic benefits that America is always bringing in such a free exchange with a nation like Romania, a nation like uh, Poland. And obviously, our nation has, in, has increased its wealth since we joined NATO, since we uh, established this partnership with America. But one cannot say the same when it comes to China. China has impoverished many nations and millions of people, especially the free people of Hong Kong. As you rightly noticed, we are witnessing a dramatic event, which is the destruction of the freedom of the beautiful prospects of prosperity for 7 million people in Hong Kong who now have to follow the rules dictated by the security and by the Communist Party in Beijing. 
We will later go right into the subject, but I would like to touch point on the link between Brexit's enemies and Hong Kong's invaders. Through the research of journalist Adrian Potrushka, we learn that the government of Hong Kong, the political puppet of the Chinese Communist Party, has hired an anti-Brexit strategist to restore its wrinkled image after the imposition of a draconian security law, which violates any trace of individual freedoms and territorial autonomy. In June, the Hong Kong government awarded a five million pound contract to the company Consulum for a PR campaign to promote the executive's image in the British press, writes Breitbart London. On Tuesday, July 7th, The Guardian announced that the head of the PR campaign, a relaunch Hong Kong, will be Ryan Koetze, none other than the former strategy director of the anti-Brexit campaign Remain in 2016 referendum, which wanted to keep Britain within the European Union. Koetze was previously the strategist for the center-left South African Democratic Alliance and then worked as strategy director for the British Liberal Democratic Party led by Nick Clegg until the 2015 general election. Coetzee left this post after a disastrous result obtained by the Liberal Democrats who only managed to keep eight of the 57 seats previously held in the House of Commons. Following the failure of the Remain campaign during the exit referendum in the summer of 2016, Ryan Coetzee he joined Consulum, where he worked for the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, to improve his image internationally. The campaign to restore the reputation of the Hong Kong government, undemocratically installed by the communist regime in Beijing, will focus on rebuilding Hong Kong and rebuilding confidence in Hong Kong as a place worth investigating in, doing business with, to work and live, the government said in a statement. The Hong Kong puppet executive says he failed the mob to mobilize the community to support law enforcement and condemn the intimidation, harassment on the internet, vandalism, crime and violent behavior of protesters during pro-democracy demonstrations. The British company's PR contract comes amid a request by a group of prominent British parliamentaries for Hong Kong chief executive Carrie Liam to be added to the list of 49 people subject to Magnitsky sanctions released Monday by Foreign Minister British Dominic Robb. Magnitsky sanctions target get people in corrupt governments, but no Chinese government official appears on Rab's list. In a statement, Dominic Rab did not rule out Lam being added to the sanctions list. Tensions between London and Beijing have risen following Prime Minister Boris Johnson's decision to grant British citizenship to Hong Kong's three million people, as well as pressure from London to exclude Chinese technology company Huawei from its 5G network. Mike, we see this connection. It's, uh, it's such a baffling connection and it's outrageous in some points. How would we address it? I don't think uh, any PR exercise can help the Communist uh, Party in uh, Beijing. Uh, after the Wuhan scandal, the whole pandemic situation, it's very hard for the Chinese government to claim that they are innocent, that they are neutral. No, the world hates what happened with three, almost four billion people uh, in, a, in a full lockdown for more than two months, you remember this spring. And they all know, the free people of the free world, they all know that the virus came from China, not from America, not from Italy, but from China. We also know that the, the virus spread in Wuhan and from Wuhan went to Los Angeles to Seattle to uh, New York and perhaps to Austin, Texas, but the virus didn't quite go that fast to, to Beijing. So people have lots of questions to ask uh, the Chinese government about you know, what happened to them. However, uh, I have to applaud the exemplary measures taken by Boris Johnson's government in Great Britain uh, towards the former British colony, that's Hong Kong. You know, sometimes people ask, you know, what's the difference between this kind of imperialism and this type of imperialism? So we know, for instance, there was, you know, many, many hundred years ago, there was an empire called the Mongol Empire. The Mongols destroyed everything they would find on their way or in their way towards new expansion. But the Brits have built, have built roads in India, they have built schools in Hong Kong and they moreover brought in to that particular island called Hong Kong, which was a, a, a feudal 
a feudal island with many, many poor people, they brought in institutions. Institutions such as, I'd say, private property, rule of law, free press, and they made these institutions, not the genetic aspect of the people, but these institutions made Hong Kong flourish. And the same applies to Australia, the same applies to Canada, other parts of the Commonwealth. So when you come up with a, a certain scheme leading a particular nation or an economy towards prosperity, um, you've got resistance. Now, wh what's the resistance against this prosperity? Where is it coming from? It's coming from, from the Communist Party in China who wants to have monopoly over power and monopoly over wealth. And they are extremely, they are extremely upset that Boris Johnson uh, extended a hand of support towards these Hong Kong protesters in particular and towards the Hong Kong population in general. Now, I wonder whether the PR expert of Nick Clegg, who failed miserably uh, some years ago in his last election, uh, whether they could ever help uh, the Chinese communists to restore their blemished image. I don't think this will ever happen. China will have to face the scrutiny of the entire world. And there are lots of people in the FBI right now, if we shift gears and we look at America, uh, asking hard questions about the personal individual responsibility of some state generals, military people in the Wuhan lab uh, when it comes to the spreading of the virus. But how do you think China can revamp from this, from this backlash? They will try to, I think, bribe lots of politicians. They, they have done so in the past. In Romania, we know for sure that the former prime minister, who is also <clears throat> somebody who plagiarized his thesis, as, as uh, the Court of Justice uh, rightly uh, declared yesterday, uh, Mr. Ponta, who was the prime minister of Romania, was somebody very close to Beijing. We see other politicians like uh, Luigi De Maio, if I'm not wrong when it comes to his name, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Italy being a defender of China. We see politicians like the famous Varoufakis in Greece defending Chinese interests in the Mediterranean Sea. So obviously China has always used the bribe, this typical oriental institution, in order to win the support of some crooked, corrupt politicians. The same happened, by the way, in Australia. So it's no surprise that they are trying to, uh, to make a comeback in, 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 in Europe uh, through various means, including PR uh, networks and, uh, and such, uh, you know, uh, such ways of uh, persuading the general public. But I don't think they will be ever successful. There is an ongoing atomic quarrel where China refuses to negotiate nuclear weapons reduction. Well, China on Friday, July 10th, rejected a new invitation from the United States to join Russian-U.S. talks on reducing nuclear arsenals. Motivating his refusal, Beijing accused Washington of distorting its position on this issue. At the end of June, the Americans and the Russians held talks in Vienna to try to extend the New START treaty. This bilateral agreement, which limits the number of nuclear warheads, expires in February 2021. The United States wants to include China in the negotiations given the country's rapidly growing nuclear capacity. China refuses, however, stressing that its nuclear arsenal cannot be compared to that of the United States and Russia. The Chinese foreign minister, however, said on Wednesday that he was open to negotiations, writes AFP, but only on the condition that Washington drastically reduces the number of nuclear warheads, 18 times higher than in Beijing. The U.S. State Department issued a statement the next day praising the statements and again calling on Beijing to negotiate. The United States welcomes China's commitment to participate in arms-controlled negotiations, the statement said, appearing to ignore Beijing's precondition. The American position was received with skepticism by the Chinese. The United States continues to harass and go so far as to distort China's position, complained Jiao Lijian, a spokesman for the Chinese foreign ministry, accusing Washington of mimicking ignorance. Wow. It's, this is strong stuff. This um, is again showing us to what extent the former American administrations were wrong to focus on the Middle East so much and to neglect China for so long. Remember 
that John Bolton, who was uh, very much involved in the invasion of Iraq uh, during the presidency of uh, Mr. Bush, wrote a damning book against Mr. Trump, uh, calling him a traitor and you know calling him names, suggesting that he was not able to stand up against President Xi, which is such a lie. Why? Because it's just Mr. Trump is the I mean he's the only American president in the last I would say 40 years, yeah, four decades, who grasped the danger of a communist China uh, when it comes to its increasing nuclear power, to its as I said economic imperialism and, and I would say, state kleptocracy. Now, I'm not an expert when it comes to uh, the nuclear weapons. I just understand what happened in the 80s uh, with Mr. Reagan versus Gorbachev. The problem here is that you might have a Republican president, and that's Donald Trump, echoing some of Mr. Reagan's insights. Both Donald Trump and Ronald Reagan uh, were courageous individuals, and I do believe that Trump is somebody almost like fearless when it comes to the American interest. The question is, uh, what will we do with Xi Jinping? Because he's no uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Mikhail Gorbachev was a reformer within the Communist Party. He did believe in the tenets of Marxist-Leninism. He was an old-fashioned communist in that respect. But he was a humane person. He was somebody able to talk, able to... Uh, understand the American position. He would visit uh, Mr. Reagan's um, ranch in California. He would laugh. He would open up. He would even critique like Stalinist figures such as Nikolai Ceausescu. We remember all that. He was also open towards the notion of Klasnos or Perestroika, that sort of warming up of the uh, Russian economy towards um, a liberalized system, a free market almost system. Uh, and that's not necessarily the vision of Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is still a, a, a Leninist. He hates religion. He hates Christianity. He doesn't believe uh, China should be second. He wants China to be first. He betrayed his father. His father was uh, marginalized, persecuted uh, during the Maoist revolution of the 1960s. He did not pardon his father, almost, for uh, standing up against Mao Zedong, um, he did everything he could in order to come back within the Communist Party. He's, he spent something like five years in, in a cave in, in some Chinese mountains, uh, the names of which escape me right now. However, he was a staunch uh, uh, Leninist who wanted to make a comeback. He made his comeback. President Xi was uh, re-elected, or rather elected at the highest position uh, the 19th Communist Party Congress or convention, and he is now the strongest man in China. The question is, so coming back to your point, is who will convince Xi Jinping to give away some of his powers and to accept a second position for China instead of the first position that he aims at? Uh, we will need a lot of conversation uh, taking place between, I'd say, President Trump and Xi Jinping, between, I'd say, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, because Russia is, uh, is, is the neighbor of China when it, when it comes to the Asian uh, part of the land that Russia uh, holds. How long do you Russia think it will holds. take? And this will take many, many years. I think the entire presidency of Mr. Trump, if he, if he gets re-elected in 2020, the entire second president, mm -hmm. presidency we'll of Mr. Trump upon. will be aimed at this kind of conversation. Again, why are we always talking about Trump and China? Because I think the outcome of the American elections will define the future of our world for, the, for 30 years uh, to come. So, Anna, if China will replace America in terms of you know, global powers, I think our generation will have huge regrets when it comes to 2020 because our generation is made of lots of millennials or post-millennials who hate Trump and they don't understand what's at stake, unfortunately. And the, at stake is our very freedom, even in military terms. When you have a nuclear, a nuclear power like China uh, menacing Japan, uh, South Korea, even India, 
then you realize they can menace, they can, uh, they can attack uh, even, uh, even Europe at some point in the future. So that's very dangerous. Britain gives up on Huawei. The decision marks a tightening of London's tone towards the Chinese communist regime after initially playing at two ends, trying not to upset either Washington or Beijing. Under pressure from the United States, engaged in what they called a Cold War with China, the London government announced on July 14th the exclusion of the Chinese technological giant Huawei from the development of the new 5G mobile telephony norm, announces the Le Point uh, correspondent in the British capital. But uh, taking into account the national telecom companies that need 5G as soon as possible and in order not to further poison bilateral relations with Beijing, Huawei will not be excluded until 2027. The decision marks a tightening of London's tone towards Beijing compares, uh, compared to the uh, pacifying tone Boris Johnson's adopted in January when Britain give, gave uh, Huawei the green light to participate in the launch of the British 5G network, limiting the company's participation to 35% of the non-network strategic British Foreign Secretary Dominic Robb was due to travel to Beijing this year to prepare for an official visit by Prime Minister Johnson. In the meantime, however, bilateral relations have uh, deteriorated severely. The heavy toll of the COVID-19 epidemic in the UK has irritated public opinion as it holds China responsible not only for the health crisis because it hid and manipulated information about the virus, but also for the economic downturn. Fair enough, because uh, we saw another Prime Minister of, of Great Britain, that's David Cameron, having a different attitude towards China. One remembers that Dalai Lama was present all over the Western world. He would get invitations from um, you know, state officials in Britain, in France, in America. Now, the first never to accept, again, the presence of a Dalai Lama in his proximity was, was David Cameron. Why did he do that? Because he was under the pressure coming from Beijing. Now, I applaud the fact that Boris Johnson is more courageous, more brave in that respect, though he has, I think, a genuine love for the Chinese culture. And by the way, we should, Anna, make it clear that when we talk about here, when we talk about uh, China versus America, we don't talk about the honorable, hardworking Chinese people who suffer under communism right now. We talk about the communist leaders of China that uh, torture and marginalize Christians, Mo uh, Mongols, uh, Tibetans, uh, and perhaps Muslims alike. So coming back to your question, Huawei is, cr is critical. I, um, I came up with a joke when I had this conversation with Douglas Murray. People can watch it on my YouTube channel. When he asked me with his superb British accent, so Mihail, who are we? I said, who are we? <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm really afraid that Huawei will always have the information, the data pertaining to your private life once they get into the system. So the question is, are we ready? to share this very, very critical information about our private lives, about our um, uh, political leanings, attachments, but also critical military information about you know, our future strategic developments. When we say our, we mean our Western world's future strategic developments within NATO and other such uh, organizations. Are we able already to share such information, such data with the Communist Party in Beijing because people don't get it, but we should make it very clear. When we talk about Huawei, we talk about a company which is not neutral, which is directly attached to the Liberation Army in, uh, in China and to the headquarters of the Communist Party in, uh, in Beijing. So there is a, a very hierarchical structure uh, there in, in Beijing, which means President Xi is in charge, he knows everything. If he wants to know what, you know, what your food preferences are, Anna, he can find out. He can just call up the head of Huawei and he very soon will find out any inform information he, he wants about individuals living in America, individuals living in Great Britain or in Romania. Thankfully, in Romania, we have rejected this desire expressed by Huawei to be part of this 5G development. Thankfully now, Britain is also rejecting this uh, approach. Why? Because they realize that in, in China, uh, they 
they used technology in order to have this micromanagerial approach towards population control. Basically, as you uh, well know, you can't go to, to a bank in China and ask for a credit without first being assessed, as it were, by some experts, and that assessment will include how do you behave towards uh, President Xi, how do you behave towards the dictator in charge. So every citizen in China is being asked to read 20 minutes when he wakes up, when he or she wakes up, he's asked to read 20 minutes excerpts from uh, President Xi's speeches. We were doing this when we were young pioneers in communist Romania. We were asked every morning to begin our day, our journey towards school by reading, you know, as I said, passages from various speeches given by Nicolae Ceausescu. They were always long speeches because communists like long speeches. They have nothing to say, but they, 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 they speak a lot. So, if you have not done your homework in China, if you're an ordinary citizen, you wake up and you don't read what President Xi said, then you will be accepted. Said, you will not be accepted, uh, you will not be given a credit by the bank of China uh, for your, perhaps, uh, for your family. And that shows you how intrusive technology has become. Technology is being used by Huawei not in order to advance science or, you know, huge projects in terms of, you know, conquering nature and the space or things of this sort. No, they are using technology in order to fully control your life and the destiny of one billion individuals in China and perhaps soon uh, billions others in, uh, in the free world. But were you expecting UK to so forcefully reject this new technology? Um, I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled. I'm not puzzled, but I'm surprised. I'm, I'm surprised. I'm puzzled because Dominic Raab seems not to have the same tone as Boris Johnson, but I'm very thankful that somehow Mr. Trump managed to persuade, uh, the, uh, persuade Boris Johnson that Huawei has no role to play in the future development of the 5D, 5G technology in, in UK. Why? Because there is a strategic strong alliance between America and Great Britain and China should never be part of that negotiation or uh, of that alliance. Never. Now I would like to revert our discussion and talk about the Christians in Hong Kong under the thumb of the Chinese Communist Party. Hong Kong's Christians fear reprisals from China's Communist Party. A national security law was passed on June 30th by China's Standing Committee superseding Hong Kong's legislature. For China's Communist Party, this measure was necessary to guarantee stability after more than a year of protests in Hong Kong. The new law ends the region's autonomy and the hope that the demands of pro-democracy protesters will be met anytime soon. Christians who participate in the demonstrations and now believe that they will be targeted if they don't toe the party line. In mainland China, Christians who defy the Chinese government's attempts to control of their churches reportedly face persecution, arrest, and detention. Underground churches are destroyed by crosses burned. Translations of the Bible must be approved by China's Communist Party and often modified to meet its demands. In Hong Kong, however, Christians enjoyed religious freedom guaranteed by the region's legal legal independence, which provided its citizens basic rights, including freedom of expression and religion. Christians, more than 10% of Hong Kong's population, held peaceful rallies during the protests by signing in, singing hymns to affirm their faith. Thousands took to the streets and many Protestants and Catholics united to defend a common cause with pro-democracy protesters. It's very important that we are seeing this reaction from uh, the Christians um, living in Hong Kong and China. We talked about this before when we mentioned the persecution of Christians all around the world. We mentioned the fact that there are Chinese bishops standing up against Beijing and there are unfortunately um, Catholic bishops uh, bribed by the Communist Party in China and um, transformed into puppets of the system. This is a very serious uh, issue. I do hope, I genuinely expect the Western leaders the Western political elite, so to speak, to have more compassion
towards the Christians persecuted in uh, China, then they head towards the Christians persecuted by ISIS and by, in general, the terrorist organizations of uh, radical Islam. Unfortunately, we saw many churches being destroyed uh, in the Middle East, including churches dating from the 3rd, 4th or 5th century uh, in Iraq, for instance, in Palmyra, in Syria, lots of such um, communities were fully destroyed. I hope that this will not happen in China, uh, but you cannot expect the Chinese government ever to tell you the truth. They are hiding the truth. And unfortunately, big corporations like Google and Microsoft, including uh, Bing, yeah, the famous um, search engine provided by Microsoft, censor information. So if you are a Christian right now in China, you, you do not, you cannot have access to information that's available to us Christians living in the free world. Why? Well, to some extent because uh, somebody like Bill Gates accepted censorship as a matter of fact. Unfortunately, the same applies to Apple and Apple accepted, for instance, that all the songs sang by protesters in Tiananmen Square should be censored and not made available to Chinese citizens via Apple Store or via Apple Music and whatnot. Anna, I really admire the fact that you are uh, paying attention to this subject and uh, I, I say it candidly because I know that for you Christian faith is very important. For you personally Christian faith is a liberating aspect of your, of your life. The, f the problem with the Communist Party in, in China is that they, they have no respect for your, for your individual dignity, for anybody's individual dignity. And so what they want you to become always is just a robot. A robot in line with the Communist Party, with the mob, with the last thoughts of the, of the, of the leader, of the supreme leader. And that's not what Christ asked us to do. Christ has very forceful things to say about truth. In the Gospel of John, we know that he said the truth sets us free and that the father of lies is the devil. I have to say that in all communist countries, the communists, which were always a minority, came to power by using a web of lies against, uh, I would say, peaceful, decent, and moderate population. This happened in uh, Tsarist Russia in 1917. This happened in our country in 1947. This happened in 1947 or 1949 in China too. Very decent people all of a sudden realized that a gang of thugs, gangsters, and I would say robbers uh, were able to control the means of production, they were able to control uh, the means of propaganda. And just like Stalin managed to destroy factories and kill, physically kill, eliminate his personal enemies, Mao Zedong did the, did the same uh, in communist China. So when we talk about this battle for freedom, of the Christians living in Hong Kong, of the Christians living in, in, in China. We have to realize that what they are battling against, what they are fighting against, is not just, you know, uh, a political system. They are not is just fighting. liberty. Fight, is, they are not just fighting even a person like Xi, Xi Jinping. They are fighting, I would say, a spiritual force, which is a demonic force, hating any form of worship towards God. Why? Because... Essentially, communism is asking you to worship the emperor, to worship the Caesar, to worship a temporary political leader like Xi Jinping, like Stalin, like Lenin, like uh, Enver Hoxha, like Ceausescu, like perhaps Gorbachev, and not to worship Christ who died for our sins on the cross in uh, Golgotha. So there's a metaphysical, I would say here, struggle for truth, not just a political negotiation between um, two forces. Unless we grasp that uh, metaphysical aspect of the battle, we are simply not uh, up to the task. And we must prevent it from spreading 
to here, the implementation also, besides the 5G technology, but the whole party of the Communist Party, correct? Yeah, and their ideas in general that we should um, do this mass control of the population, that we should know everything about any private citizen uh, only because that's doable or possible through technology. Yes, this technology is, is fantastic when it comes to us connecting our thoughts, our ideas to our friends in America, our friends in Western Europe, our friends in Australia, because I know that our show is now being watched by people all over the world, and that's great, and we thank everybody for watching us, the Liberty Hub. So technology is, is very important in terms of spreading good ideas to the entire world. But technology is also a dangerous tool when it comes to, again, um, an ugly power, an ugly system, uh, again, based or built on monstrosities, atrocities, murders uh, of no equal, it's dangerous to have such a technology in the hands of, of, of thugs uh, leading a party like the Communist Party in China. That's why we have to bring in, in our Western societies, in our Western countries, more um, fences against uh, the intrusion and the encroachment of the Chinese Communist Party. Thank you, Mike. This was a wonderful edition. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. <laughs>